I'll welcome everyone to uh, get another BIMR seminar and uh, Boyang, you can do the introduction. Sounds good. All right, we'll get started. So yeah, welcome everyone to uh, the second week of our seminar series in uh, tissue engineering and 3D bioprinting. So uh, this week, I'm very excited to welcome uh, Professor Jeremy Hirota. Uh, Jeremy obtained his bachelor and PhD degree from McMaster University in physiology and pharmacology. Um, so he graduated from the, specifically from the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health. And after that, he uh, did a postdoc uh, did a postdoc work at University of British Columbia. And uh, after his postdoc, uh, we're glad that Jeremy decided to return home to McMaster, where he is now the Canada Research Chair in Respiratory Mucosal uh, Immunology at Mac. Uh, so Jeremy has a broad interdisciplinary program that focuses on cell biology, tissue engineering, biomedical engineering, and bioinformatics. Uh, as well as translational lung research. Um, and Jeremy also uh, is an entrepreneur. He is a co-founder and CEO of uh, Infinotype, a software company that focuses on health informatics and molecular phenotyping. Um, a little bit personal note here, I, uh, I first met Jeremy at uh, a conference uh, and the conference was about 3D bio printing uh, at the University of uh, British Columbia. And, and that was before I started at Mac. And, uh, and uh, Jeremy was one of the first people I contacted for collaboration immediately after I started at McMaster. And that was in 2018. And I, since then I have worked with Jeremy on many grant applications. Uh, Jeremy has been really an invaluable mentor to me since I joined Mac. And uh, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, so without further ado, let's welcome Jay and uh, I look forward to your talk. Thanks, Bo Yang. And, and I'll, I'll say that I, I just, I bet on the winning horses. And so I saw you, you know, and I said, well, I should just, I should, I should ride on to this one. Um, no, but in all seriousness, um, it's, it's a very, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, this is an audience that I don't typically present to uh, materials, individuals and chemical engineers and chemists. So uh, it's always good for me to get out of my comfort zone and maybe build some bridges that um, yet I haven't, uh, you know, um, explored. So uh, to begin though, um, a formal land acknowledgement um, and I'll read it word by word and I would like you to all reflect upon the acknowledgement. I begin by giving honor and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and Ashinanabe nations as the traditional inhabitants of the lands where McMaster University stands and where I speak from today or from my home. To say this is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us to recognize our responsibility as guests to respect and honor their intimate relationship uh, to the, the people have had to this land before. Um, so to begin um, with the objectives of what I hope to go over today, and I will look at my main screen. So if I'm not looking at the screen, I apologize. Um, the, I recognize that this audience isn't necessarily respiratory focused, is not lung focused. So I, I do have to do a little bit of a background on what the Firestone Institute of Respiratory Health is, a little bit of its history, what it focuses on, and, and probably set some context on why we should be interested in studying lung health and disease to begin with. Uh, because otherwise, if I just dive into what we're doing, you're not gonna have that context or sort of the, the history uh, behind it here at McMaster, which is, which is very long. Uh, and, and then trying to speak to this particular audience, uh, I decided to pick one lung disease or one lung condition um, that I say has a material change. Um, there are material changes and so it may resonate with this audience a little bit better than some uh, lung conditions or lung diseases. And then I'll, I'll go into describing how through these interdisciplinary collaborations and building the bridges, we're trying to in, I'll update the models that are used and, and integrate new features like stiffness and stretch into these models. So to begin, um, a history of the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health. Um, really, the Firestone Institute is a global leader in clinical and translational and basic research in, in respiratory disease. Um, and it has a long history here in Hamilton and at McMaster. 
Um, way back in 1965, Moran Campbell, the black and white image here, if you can see my mouse, um, Moran Campbell was recruited from the UK. He was a respirologist uh, and he, he was recruited to McMaster as the first chair of medicine at McMaster University. Uh, and so right away, right from the beginning at McMaster University, there was a, uh, a global expertise in, in respirology. And later on that evolved with the help of philanthropy, um, which has been a constant theme of the Firestone Institute over the years uh, with Morgan Firestone um, providing um, um, funds to create the Firestone Regional Chest and Allergy Unit, FRCAU, uh, which brought in other global leaders and continued sort of this snowball effect of attracting talent to McMaster in, in the, the fields of respirology and allergy. And through that, um, you know, that, that sort of critical mass, we had individuals like Gordon Guyatt, who is still over here in the Faculty of Health Sciences, Stu Pugsley, um, the late Freddie Hargreave, um, Mike Newhouse, Myrna Dolovich, who's still uh, working as an engineer here, who's, who specializes in, in aerosol chemistry and aerosol particles. Her partner, um, uh, the, the late Jerry Dolovich, they really started to, um, uh, on a global level, uh, learn how to identify respiratory disease, um, diagnose it, uh, treat it, uh, manage it. And, and really they set global standards that exist today for how respiratory disease is managed. And there were questionnaires, Liz Juniper was involved as well that can be, that are used and copyrighted and used around the world. And, and even the treatment of the disease and the development and validation of, of uh, new medications led by our own Dean of Factive Health Sciences, Dr. Paul Byrne here. This long history created a, a bit of a tradition that attracted a next sort of generation of researchers that continue to push forward in respiratory medicine, uh, allergy um, and, and sleep medicine. And we've more recently partnered with thoracic surgery uh, down at St. Joseph's Hospital as well. And I, I try to kind of put this into a, like the, an increasing sort of a, a ramping up um, sort of profile here because I think there's only more to come in the years to come with the Firestone. And, and at the Firestone, you know, throughout its years, there have been innovations um, before, but led by the individuals within the Firestone. And before those, um, or the first would be from uh, Morgan Firestone, who actually helped develop the Venturi mask for controlled oxygen delivery, which is still used. It's an it's internationally used measure of giving controlled oxygen. Uh, he did that before he came to the Firestone, but it was a demonstration. That this was what things to come from the Firestone. Um, Mike Newhouse and Myrna Dolovich developed the Aero Chamber, again, interdisciplinary work between clinicians and, and engineers, where this helped deliver those puffers to children or other people that couldn't deliver the drugs properly to their lungs. And so Trudeau Medical, you know, has the rights to this and it's used globally as a way to, to properly deliver medications. More recently, doctors Jerry Cox and Param Nair have been working on new therapies um, for, for ablating the damaging material in, in the lung of people with disease to sort of turn their lungs back into normal um, um, scenarios. And with Param, he's also working with some engineers and chemists to, to try to identify non-invasive ways to monitor someone's disease, whether they're going to have a flare up of their disease or whether they need more medication. And so there really have been these, these interdisciplinary collaborations for a long time. Um, and you know, I've asked myself what's gonna fuel that next generation as I hopefully stay here for many years to come. And I think that's grounded in working closely with the clinicians. Um, they really know what the clinical problems are, the, the problems that the patients face uh, and their caregivers face. Uh, and it's the, that interaction between the clinicians and the biomedical researchers, sometimes they're both clinician scientists down at the Firestone, that's really driven the Firestone over the years. And you know, what, what has emerged is also this relationship with engineers and now more so even some of the natural science, the chemists and the materials engineers um, to, to, to focus on those clinical problems and provide solutions that address those clinical problems. And my bias, you know, as Bo Yang mentioned, the conflict of interest is that we are you know, starting a software company in informatics space. 
is that um, you know data sciences and bioinformatics and molecular phenotyping is going to be a central feature to provide insights into the clinical care, into the clinical management, but it may be even also from those tools that are being developed by the engineers. Um, and so this is where we see uh, the Firestone evolving in the future and still maintaining that central focus on clinical care. Now, in relation to building those interdisciplinary collaborations and those bridges, um, I really wouldn't be here in front of you all um, today without these people listed on the slide. Um, you know, as Bo Yang said, maybe I was the first person that he reached out to. One of the first engineers I think I reached out to was Ravi. Uh, Ravi welcomed me with open arms. You know, he opened my eyes to how engineers think, um, you know, just a different way of thinking than maybe a biomedical researcher did. He, he accepted those deficiencies and, um, you know, helped um, show me that there were new ways of doing things. Um, definitely introduced me to um, individuals like Bo Yang or, or suggested that Bo Yang was coming to McMaster, maybe someone I should talk to. Uh, along the way, I would say Jose Moran as Mirabel as well. Um, I can't remember the introduction how Jose and I met, but definitely our paths crossed and you know, different um, skill sets and expertise. And I think one plus one is turning into three. Um, down the road at the University of Toronto is Scott Ramsey. He's a materials engineer. He's, he's a teaching stream but he had an excellent student, um, which I'll get to Crystal Liu. Um, and you know, through this teaching stream in a non-biomedical space, we found a bridge to connect us. And Yaron is our uh, head of thoracic surgery down at, at, the, uh, at St. Joe's. And he's also been crucial for all of the work that you're going to be seeing. And I wanted to put this slide up early. I find that oftentimes I end up rushing through the acknowledgement slide at the end, and really, I wouldn't be here without um, all of the, the individuals, including all the trainees. I mean, as we all know, the trainees are the ones doing the heavy lifting. There's Mabel, who's Jose has already spoken of, Mode, who is a PhD student in Ravi's group, but also um, now a postdoc in my group. Um, you know, there's, they're big drivers in the programs and the data that you're gonna see today. So that was a little bit of a history of the Firestone and where I find myself and where I see the need for these interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, but I do wanna come back to this question of why study lung health and disease in the first place. And I wanna give that context on why I think it's important and why maybe you'll think it's important. When you look at the numbers um, across the world, it is one of the leading causes, causes of uh, global morbidity and mortality uh, would be in the top five. Uh, and it is projected to be in the top five, it's not going anywhere. Um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, which is listed first here, uh, this tends to happen in an older population, population that may smoke tobacco um, or be exposed to biomass, but that's 200 million people worldwide uh, have this um, uh, COPD. Then asthma, which may be a little bit more familiar to the audience, tends to be considered something that happens more in children, but it, it happens across all age groups. And that's 300 million people. And, and here's a, the unfortunate statistic that even with very good medications and treatment guidelines, over a thousand people a day are dying from their asthma attacks. Um, you know, acute lower respiratory tract infections has, has definitely in the last couple of years, um, everyone's become aware of those. But even before COVID-19, there were 4 million deaths a year because of these infections. Uh, you know, influenza wiped out 100,000 people in, in the States every year, and we didn't really think about it. Um, so th th there are issues um, in the lung uh, health and disease space that are constant. And importantly, they're not going away and they're probably going to grow. Um, there are genetic predispositions, so the gene components to these respiratory diseases, but there's also environmental factors, so gene environment interactions that are leading to the increasing prevalence of these lung conditions. They're not going away, and climate change, whether you, you're a proponent of it and you believe in it or not, that, that this is happening. There's greater um, pollen distribution, which could lead to greater asthma attacks. There's, uh, the wildfires are increasing. In, in number and intensity, and these are leading to greater hospitalizations on individuals with chronic respiratory diseases. So overall, we don't really see this going away and it's going to become more of a problem in the future. And that's borne out by the data. 
Um, this is a 2020 review of the global burden of disease with a focus on respiratory diseases. And whether you break it down with females or males in the 90s, um, if we look at Canada, we'd say roughly 10% or just maybe if we go on the low end, 7% of the population in Canada had a chronic respiratory disease. Um, when we look at that, um, you know, shy of 30 years later, we're climbing. It's not going down. Um, and again, this is normalized for, for 100,000 people. So it's not because of population growth. It's actually per a unit of 100,000 people. So we're getting an increase, a 20, 15% increase in chronic respiratory disease just here in Canada. And that's not looking at the other regions around the world. And that's happening in males and females. So it affects us all. Um, it also affects all age groups. These chronic respiratory diseases, as I said, asthma may be considered a disease that predominantly you know, impacts the, the younger population, as you'll see here um, uh, on the left of these axes for both males and females. Asthma, asthma is the dominant respiratory disease, but it doesn't go away with aging. So it's throughout the whole um, uh, aging spectrum. Um, but what you do see is that with, uh, as aging happens and individuals may pick up smoking or they're exposed to more uh, biomass um, combustion or other combustion byproducts, there can be an increased uh, prevalence of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which creeps up with age as well. And then this last little one, which is going to be the disease that will disease area, which I'll focus on for the rest of the talk, are these interstitial lung diseases, and which sort of fibrotic lung diseases that lead to a stiffening of the lung disease or, or the lung and a decreased ability um, to breathe properly and to get oxygen transfer in the lung. And those are creeping up in the older years as well. So it happens across males, females, all ages and there's different diseases that happen and it's increasing over time. So this is a problem, that's my case. Um, but I also recognize that giving that context of these different lung diseases, you know, the numbers, um, the types of people or the demographics that they're impacting, I do need to get down to a little bit of the biology on what these different lung diseases are doing. Again, to set the stage for the rest of the talk. So at, at the simplest level, um, you know, we breathe through a, a big tube, which is the trachea, which we have in panel A here. The trachea is a branching structure and it goes into bronchi left and right. And then those bronchi, and it's just a branching structure like a tree would do. And that's what you see in the blue here in this branching structure. And those branches are conducting airways, which is the top of panel B. And these are the airways conduct the air. This isn't where gas exchange occurs. This isn't where oxygen and, and carbon dioxide are exchanged. This is just where the conduits, which the air flows through. And it's actually down in the alveoli, um, these little grape-like sacs. This is where the gas exchange is occurring in the parenchyma of the lung, the sort of peripheral parts of the lung. And that's where the gas exchange is occurring. And in between the airways and the, and the alveoli, I, I'm generalizing here a bit, but there's definitely vasculature that makes sure that there's gas exchange between those different compartments of the lung. And now if we progress to panel C, these are a variety of different cell types that may be present in the different regions of the lung. So around airways, you may have more smooth muscle cells because they can allow for contraction of that smooth muscle. The vasculature, again, there's changes in vascular tone, relaxation or contraction of the vasculature. And the parenchyma as well, there may be requirement for immune cells because you're breathing in something and maybe it's a pathogen or it needs to be cleared or it needs to be eaten up. So there'll be immune cells that will be involved in those processes. And so you see that there's a variety of different cells that this cartoon is depicting. So that's a healthy lung. These are sort of, this is the broad architecture of what it um, looks like and the ingredients that make it up. And, and when we think of those different diseases, um, they, they don't go through all of the lung in the same way. Um, asthma tends to be an airways disease. It, it doesn't affect the parenchyma or the alveoli. It, it, it's restricted to the airways. It leads to thickening of the airways and contraction of the airways. 
uh, cystic fibrosis. I didn't talk about that disease earlier, but it's more of a, an airways restricted disease. Pulmonary hypertension is another um, um, lung disease, but that's more in the vasculature. So there's changes remodeling, thickening, and even fibrosing of, of the vasculature. Uh, but then as we work down, we have the COPD again, which is actually a disease that impacts both the alveoli, where when you have destruction of the alveoli, you, you, you break up these grape-like structures. And instead of it being nice bunches of grapes, it turns into a big balloon and gas exchange doesn't occur properly in that big balloon. But COPD is also as airways components. Now, lastly, I have this interstitial lung diseases, that small group of diseases, these rare diseases, um, but they tend to occur only in the periphery, in, in the interstitium. Um, and, and they lead to uh, destruction of the alveoli and loss of gas exchange capacity. Um, so, you know, th those are it's just a really, what is that, a, a 10 minute overview of lung health and disease on a global scale with the epidemiology, but then also the spectrum of lung diseases that occur and the areas in which they occur. Uh, I recognize it's extremely high level, but Bo Yang did say, go broad, don't, don't necessarily go, go deep on one, one disease. So I, I blame Bo Yang or I put it on him. Uh, moving on, um, I, I did want to speak to this audience in the context of what they may be interested in. And I thought that lung fibrosis might actually be that case. Um, because there are these material changes to the lung that materials engineers and chemists and other individuals might, might actually find interesting and maybe be able to solve. Um, so if we talk about that, that interstitial lung disease, that really small blue bar that slowly crept up with age, more of a rare disease group, um, we have this normal alveolar structure. I said it's like a bunch of grapes. And there's this thin, you know, a barrier between the inside of the alveoli, which is exposed to the air we breathe, and the capillary of, of the vasculature that sort of surrounds that alveolar sac. And this is where gas exchange happens. And this is, this is demonstrated by these arrows, the oxygen coming in from the, the air we breathe in, the fresh air, and the carbon dioxide diffusing out. And there's just this little thin barrier that, that um, the gases have to transport across. You know, that's in the normal situation. But in a fibrotic situation, you actually have um, a, a thickening of that barrier. So immediately, independent of what the composition of that is, one can probably imagine that there's going to be a, a, an impedance against that oxygen diffusing into the vasculature and probably vice versa, the CO2 coming out. And the patients will actually, that's the symptoms that they present with is a cough, a shortness of breath, very much likely, very you know, likely due to the inability to get effective oxygen transport. Um, and then there's other abnormalities that are probably indirect, like loss of appetite and weight loss, um, you know, loss of energy. Maybe we're not feeling as as uh, up to it. And and these are the early symptoms that are observed or reported by patients. Um, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of these lung um, fibrosis conditions um, are there's no cure and they are fatal uh, in a relatively um, short time. Um, the survival, median survival of an IPF patient is, is less than an uh, individual has lung cancer, as an example. Lung cancer has really improved over the years with treatment options, but lung fibrosis, not so. Um, and what has to happen, probably because of this dysfunction in the barrier and destruction of the alveoli, uh, you need supplemental oxygen, which is sort of one step away from needing to have a lung transplant. And without lung transplant, um, inevitably the individual will, will die of, of this disease. Um, I am also generalizing here because by saying lung fibrosis, there's, there's you know, around 40 different labels of lung fibrosis uh, that are out there. Uh, Martin Kolb, who's our division head um, and, and research director at the Firestone, is an is a international leader in interstitial lung disease. Uh, and he has a term where he's called lumping and splitting these. And so really, they can be lumped together. And, and when you lump it together, you see this Venn diagram. They all fall together in this lung fibrosis sort of category. 
where you get these changes in the alveolar structure um, that lead to changes in the matrix and the material components make up the alveoli and ultimately a, a loss in diffusing capacity for oxygen and, and a pathology observed, a remodeling of the airways and, and increased morbidity and mortality in the patients. And there's multiple sort of causes for these. Um, although in a disease like idiopathic, that word being, we don't really know the cause of, there is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis where we don't know what initiated it, um, but, but it leads to the disease. And what I wanted to show you here was this is, this is actual lung pathology. These are actual samples taken from, from patients uh, or, or individuals uh, as part of their clinical care. So on the left is an individual who didn't have an interstitial lung disease, but needed a, a procedure for another reason. And you'll see a lots of white uh, the white are these alveolar areas or these air spaces where gas exchange can occur. Um, and, and they're nice, fine structures. Uh, they're not really thick. Um, and, and this is where, you know, that, that thin alveolar structure, um, what it looks like actual with real tissue. But on the right, we have this fibrotic case. And in this fibrotic case, you'll see that a lot of those white spaces are gone and really these large white spaces are there. These aren't alveoli, these are airways, or these might be even blood vessels. And so these aren't for gas exchange. In this particular section, the units for gas exchange are largely gone or destructed. And so this is what a real case looks like. This is what a patient looks like when they're, they have this disease. Um, and I think I can make the case there are material changes to the lung um, that, that lead to, to the pathology. And, and looking into what these changes actually are, um, this is uh, you know, a cartoon that is trying to summarize some of those changes um, that may occur. Uh, in a healthy situation, you can have collagen fibers, fibular collagen that's present. It can be bound to the basement membrane as well as some of the fibroblasts that reside in the interstitial space. Um, it can be bound through integrins. Um, there can be elastic fibers that give that elastic property, the recoil property of, of the lung in a healthy situation. But in lung fibrosis, there's an amplification of a lot of these features and then even a changing of the cell types that were normally there. They, they morph into a cell that has more contractile properties. They morph into a cell that actually secretes more matrix proteins, more collagen, more elastins, more fibronectin. Uh, and then there's a rearrangement of those, those extracellular matrix components as well. So there's, there's a changing of the mechanical properties of the matrix. There's not just more of them, but the way those are rearranged changes as well. Uh, so there can be cross-linking of the collagens um, and then there can be uh, interactions between additional extracellular matrix molecules. So there really is a change in the biochemical cue from in the extracellular matrix in lung fibrosis. And that cartoon had maybe 10 things in it, maybe, maybe you know, features that could change. But um, when uh, proteomic analysis was done on, and this is from a mouse lung, but it, it can be largely representative of a human lung, in a healthy situation, um, th there was an identification of over 150 extracellular matrix proteins in a healthy lung. Uh, collagens are there, fibronectins are there, laminins are there. Um, but these are all present and they all constitute sort of the, the framing of, of the lung, the framework of the lung. And you can imagine that all 150 of these things may change in the fibrotic environment. And now you're going to have you know, significant material changes, which could influence how stiff the lung is, you know, how the microenvironment in which the cells live in. And that is actually borne out, you know, at the macro level within fibrotic lung tissue. Um, if we, this is what a human lung looks like if it's removed from an individual, uh, it, it is kind of just loses all its shape and just sort of like a wet bag that kind of sits, you know, lies flat. Uh, but if you actually um, probe that um, in, and you try to measure the Young's modulus in a normal lung, 
these are two lung, two patients done and repeated measurements at different parts of the lung. Um, you, you get a young modulus under 10 for the most part in some regions it may get up there, um, but all the way to, to 0.5. So there's this range within the lung, within a healthy lung of what the young's modulus is. And remember, that's probably an integration of all those ECM components that are there. I'm, I'm not trying to attribute this to one or the other. But in a lung fibrosis case, there's a significant increase in the Young's modulus. Um, maybe there's regions in the fibrotic lung which are normal, which find themselves down here. But in those fibrotic regions, there's definitely um, an increase in the Young's modulus. And this is with cells present. So the argument could be made, well, is it the cells or is it the matrix that's contributing to it? And, and actually when those tissues are decellularized and you remove all the cellular component and you're just left with the extracellular matrix, you can see that there's that persistence of that elevated Young's modulus uh, in the absence of cells. So the extracellular matrix really, we, we think it has changes in bio, biochemical cues, but it's gonna be clearly giving changes in mechanical cues to the cells too uh, in a fibrotic case. Now, so now if we can imagine that, that that's an acellular environment and we have matrix from a normal situation or matrix from a fibrotic lung. And, and so we say, okay, the, I've been trying to make the case that those matrices, whether through um, mechanical or biochemical cues can influence cells. That's the case I'm trying to make. And that's what this data is showing here is if we are to grow in the first three, I'm, I'm trying to circle these first three samples, these first three black bars. And if we grow a, a cell called a fibroblast, which is a cell that normally exists in the lung, if we grow that cell on normal matrix, normal ECM lung, they express a certain amount of basal level of this alpha smooth muscle actin which is sort of a marker for a myofibroblast or a contractile cell phenotype. But if we take those same cells and we grow it on the fibrotic ECM, what we see is we see a shift in those cells. Those shells, cells change their phenotype. So they're being influenced by that matrix. Now, in this particular case, they didn't implicate, was it the biochemical cue or was it a mechanical cue? But the point is that, that matrix was instructing the cell on what it should become. And that, you know, another way to visualize that is on the left is if we take a fibroblast and we grow it on normal matrix, the amount of alpha smooth muscle actin that expressed is very low because you don't see any brown here. This, there's an immunohistochemistry that would stain brown for smooth muscle actin. But in contrast, when you grow fibroblasts on uh, fibrotic ECM, you get more brown, which is indicative of this smooth muscle actin. So there's some mechanical and biochemical cues, I'm not saying which one, that's, that's coming from the ECM um, that's being sensed by the cells. And that, there's been sort of a, an attempt to understand the, that how that's being translated from a extracellular matrix or extracellular environment to the cell and maybe to the, um, uh, to the cell and how it can reprogram itself. And I'll try to walk through this, this cartoon that is, you know, is most up to date on, on the, the understanding. Is that if you have this extracellular matrix that is normal, there are some components or some collagen there. And these collagens can interact with the cell through molecules, the cell recognizes them. The cell adheres to these ECM components through integrins, which are these purple and, and yellow features. And um, under these conditions, this is a normal environment. Um, the, the inside the cell isn't that tense. There's, there's not a lot of interactions between the integrins and the extracellular matrix. So there's a lot of plasticity of that cell in a normal environment. And it's best sort of explained then when you have the contrasting picture of what happens in a stiff environment. And in a stiff environment, you have more extracellular matrix and, in, and that extracellular matrix leads to more tethering, more contacts between the cell and the matrix, which then stiffens the cell. 
and it can rearrange the, the cytoskeleton with inside the cell. And so that cell senses the stiffness through these integrants. It senses its surface through these integrants. And in doing so, that signal can transmit inside the cell and lead to changes in gene expression and, and transport of transcription factors. And in this case, there's this complex, this YAP-TAS complex, uh, which they, they purposely have this sort of red X here because they don't know exactly how the, the mechanotransduction occurs yet. But what does happen is on a stiff environment, this YAPTAS transcription factor complex goes to the nucleus. And that's crucial for changing the cell phenotype in a process called mechanotransduction. And if I bring that to lung fibrosis, that's exactly what's happening in lung fibrosis. So on the left images that you see, these are healthy images of human lung. And these are stained using histology. So we, we're looking for the protein of interest. We're looking for TAS protein and healthy. And we're looking for YAP protein and healthy. And, and I, I hope you can't see much brown in, in those YAP and TAS and the healthy. But as we move to the fibrosis stained lung samples, we see more brown in the TAS and more brown for the YAP in the fibrotic lungs. And you know, quantifying that as, as we do, you know, looking at biopsies, we can see that in the fibrotic cases, there's, there's an increased number of positive cells for these two um, transcription factors that are associated with sensing the, um, the stiffer environment. And, you know, the, so the, the hypothesis there is that when it's a stiff environment, the cells sense this, and then the YAP-TAS complex trans locates to the nucleus and starts reprogramming that cell to change and turn into a, a, a reinforcing a fibrotic cycle on, in a, to try to repair this wound that occurs. And so that's been a, in, interrogated at a cellular level using different stiffness plates. So you can grow cells on soft or hard plates and that are trying to model healthy or fibrotic conditions. And, and so I've labeled that here healthy for the 0.4 kilopascals and, and 25 for the um, uh, or fibrotic for the 25 kilopascals. And using three different types of fibroblasts, which again are these cells that will reside sort of in the interstitium and interact with the matrix. Using three different types of fibroblasts, uh, this group studied, well, what happened with YAP-TAS and on the different surfaces. And you can see that um, in the, um, the green of the YAP-TAS, the cytosolic, maybe a little bit in, in the nucleus on cell type one, but largely didn't go to the nucleus. But on a stiff surface, that cell was able to sense that and transduce that into a bio, that biochemical cue into a, a, a gene or a, a change in gene expression pattern where we had this transcription factor get to the nucleus and indeed that's associated with production of more collagen. And so it's turning on this transcriptional profile to, to lead to greater ECM production. Uh, and so it's sort of one of these unfortunate situations where um, the wound, the environment is dictating um, uh, the subsequent um, cycle and, and the development. And this is actually what happens in fibrosis. This is why there's no cure. This is why it's a progressive disease is the lung environment through the matrix or through the stiffness. It drives the aberrant cell biology and this translocation of some transcription factors, which in turn lead to more matrix being produced, which in turn changes the lung environment. And we get this sort of this negative cycle, negative spiral, which is why three to five years survival for some individuals with these, these fibrotic lung conditions. Okay, so I'm mindful of the time here. So, you know, based on that, I hopefully made the case that lung fibrosis is a really interesting disease or class of diseases. And there are some material changes involving the ECM components, the stiffness. Um, and so we want to begin exploring that um, through these interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. And I'll start by integrating the stiffness. And this is work that, um, again, centralized, you know, on this interaction of cells, with the ECM 
uh, and perhaps with some, some translocation of transcription factors that can sense this um, stiffness. Help with, with Jose, uh, we've been working on developing different hydrogels, both 3D and, and 2D models. Because really, if we grow on plastic, sorry, if we grow on tissue culture plastic, that is nowhere near where what lung actually should be. And so we want to begin growing on environments, proper stiffness, but also proper biochemical cues that lungs, lung cells will actually grow on in, in normal situations. So we're trying to move away from the uh, tissue culture plastic and move towards more where lungs are. And that's important uh, because this is, this is not our data, um, but earlier demonstrations that if you did grow your lung fibroblasts on normal ECM and normal stiffness, this is sort of, you, you don't get an outgrowth of these myofibroblasts or these pathogenic cells. You, you maintain a, a normal cell, a non-pathologic cell. But as you increase the stiffness of the surface that those fibroblasts grow on, they start changing into these pathogenic myofibroblasts that secrete more matrix. And here's tissue culture plastic as the positive control showing that it really drives a, a pathologic phenotype. And this is being quantified here by the percent change of these cells, depending on the stiffness of the surface they grow on. And so we wanted to not grow those necessarily just on, on PDMS and different, different um, sort of uh, stiffnesses of the PDMS. We wanted to actually use uh, human lung ECM so that it could also have the biochemical cues that are from uh, in, in situ environment. So we take a, this is a protocol of decellularization that has been developed um, by a former McMaster colleague uh, down in, in Boston, uh, Sarah Gilpin. And really it was pioneered with uh, whole lungs where you perfuse through a variety of detergents and washes and you can get rid of all these cells. And then you're left with the shell. And in our group, what we do, we do that on a smaller piece. We don't get the same size of lung tissue, but we can bring it through a series of these washes and we're left with a powder and this powder we can turn into some hydrogels with the help of individuals like Jose and other experts um, and begin using this for advanced sort of 2D, 2.5D, 3D model systems. Uh, and this is a demonstration of what, what happens after a decellularization process. Uh, the blue are nuclei that would exist normally. And these are the nuclei of cells in a normal lung. And this is when it's decellularized. We, we lose all the cells, which is good but you can see what's left behind is there's this structure. So there is some extracellular matrix that's left behind. The mass on trichrome is the blue is collagen. We still have some blue left. We do, we do lose some collagen during this decellularization process. Um, the EVG, elastic grand Giesen stain, um, the black being the elastic fibers. We still maintain some of those as well. We do lose some, but on, on, by and large, we maintain um, the distribution of those ECM components in our decellularized material. And then subsequently we can use that in our hydrogel experiments. Um, we have played with different concentrations of these, uh, the DECM, the decellularized extracellular matrix uh, in, in looked at how these gels spontaneously, well, I guess I should say concentrations of DECM spontaneously gel uh, at 37 degrees. Um, we didn't see a really big change um, in the time course for, for these to gel uh, at the different concentrations. Um, so that was just an observation that was made by uh, the postdoc, Mode Debagi, who I believe is on the call, um, is integral to this work. This is a demonstration of the, the, the structures of these gels that can be made at these different concentrations. Um, we weren't able to quantify any differences in the fiber diameter per se, uh, and even qualitatively looking at the organization of these fibers, um, they didn't seem to be um, significantly different. Um, so at least without cells being present in these gels, they kind of all look the same. But when Mode took lung fibroblasts and put them in, to these, these gels of different concentrations of DCM, that's where we began to see differences in the properties of the gels. Uh, whether it was at the lowest concentration, 
um, going up to the highest concentration, um, the, the fibroblasts tended to contract that gel better at the lower concentration. So we, we assume that there's changes in mechanical properties of that hydrogel, and those experiments are ongoing at this point where we can actually characterize um, um, the stiffness of these gels at the different concentrations. And all of that work um, has been done with normal ECM, not fibrotic lung ECM. And we're moving forward with doing that on, on fibrotic lung ECM. And those experiments are even being done as of this week, where we have a collaboration to get some fibrotic lung tissue. And the goal is to avoid using tissue culture plastic as, as best possible. The next sort of set of models that we're developing, and, and I do want to highlight on the word on this talk, I said, the, the title is advancing models. It's not that we've already advanced them. We are advancing them. So we're not necessarily there with the stiffness, but we're going there. And the same is going to be said here about stretch. And so stretch is another sort of um, mechanism by which this yap has um, pathway can be activated and the extracellular environment might be sort of transmitted uh, to the intracellular environment. And this is a cartoon, which is really interesting because you might, you might ask your question, you say, well, if, if what, a, how does someone get on that, that spiral? How does someone get on that, that feedback loop that leads to excessive fibrosis? Um, and in health, if I'm healthy, what's going to happen to me? And in healthy situations, this is the model that's being proposed for lung is that there is a very compliant ECM and the cells that are present are these normal fibroblasts. And it's compliant and it allows for movement and stretch, which doesn't release any of these growth factors. In this case, this is called TGF beta. And it doesn't release this biochemical signal that, that says, hey, we've got a wound going on here. So in a normal situation, there isn't enough tension to release a, a, a growth factor that signals there's a problem. But in contrast, when you have a stiff matrix, and the stiff matrix I've already shown you changes those fibroblasts to myofibroblasts. That's one thing that happens. And those myofibroblasts, then they have, they have the ability to bind to um, this, this growth factor in the extracellular space. And so now when they're stretching in that environment, there's enough tension to release this growth factor. And so it's believed that there's this myofibroblast triggered through integrin release of a growth factor that leads to um, greater ECM production and this, this feedback um, loop. And Martin Kolb here at McMaster uh, has actually demonstrated that quite elegantly um, with this rig using both rat and human lung samples. And in this rig, he has a force transduce, it's, it's low throughput, single sample at a time, but force transducer and, and an arm which can actuate this tissue in a bath and it can control it for the duration, the amplitude, the frequency. And when they did that on rat lung, that is from healthy people, healthy lung, not diseased lung, and whether they stretched it or not, they didn't see any change in that growth factor activation. So that's hopefully everybody on this call. We don't have this fibrotic lung disease, so if we breathe a lot or if we go for a run, there's nothing gonna be wrong with us. But in contrast in this rat model of lung fibrosis, at baseline, because it's a fibrotic lung, there's an activation of this pathway. But then when they stretched it, they got an increase well above the baseline. So there's sort of this feed forward mechanism that happens with stretch, but it needs to have the background of the stiff matrix for it to occur. And they also saw that with human lung isolated from individuals with fibrotic lung disease. So it wasn't just an animal model phenomenon. It actually happened with explanted human lung tissue. Again, normal human lung tissue, hopefully from all of us in the call, whether you stretched it a lot or not, it didn't lead to any feed forward mechanism. But in individuals that have pulmonary fibrosis, at baseline, they do have elevated activation because they have this disease. But then when you stretch it, it turned it on even more. And so you're almost getting a doubling of the activation in these IPF samples. And so that sort of segues into something that we've been chasing, um, developing a tool in-house to increase the throughput, but also incorporate some of the hydrogel work that we're doing with Jose and others. 
And this is sort of, I want to say it's one of those uh, upsides of COVID is that um, I was on Twitter and I was searching through and Maud and myself both saw this. This was a video that was on Twitter that Crystal had put up and Crystal was having to make this, this material stretcher for a class that she was TAing but it had to be done all virtually because it was COVID. And so she made this all, built this all, boxed it all and sent it out to all of her students in her class so that the students in the class had it to keep but also could experiment with it at home all throughout the course. And Crystal is just an incredible individual, which I think you probably get from just that idea of doing that. And so we decided to, to iterate on that and you know, build in a screen that we could program. It's Raspberry Pi driven. So we can change how the lung breathes, you know, whether it's stepped and it's held, um, different, different waveforms. Oops, sorry. And these are little PDMS chambers that we'll have cells growing in. Um, you know, zoom in on these chambers and arguably we could coat those with different DECMs of different stiffnesses if we want from different lung sources, healthier disease. Um, we can tune that machine. I'm just mindful of the time. These are sort of the, the parameters. We can stretch 10%, 20%, 30%. We could change the frequency by which we do this. It comes in all at under $1,000 if we include everything, all the features. As I said, it's programmable, so we can change the waveforms for it as needed and lock in user profiles. And, and this is sort of the, the most up-to-date form that we have, we call it the cell and tissue stretcher, the cat stretcher. Um, and uh, this is it actually in, in the hood with fibroblast cells, uh, I think on Thursday, yesterday. And so we are really you know, pushing this forward. This is in development. Um, we are having some challenges, but that being said, it is working. And this is a demonstration of where we're hoping to go, hopefully you can see that these are being oscillated. Um, this is a 10% stretch. Um, we do record the waveforms and we can output this data so we can sort of track to make sure that the stretcher is doing what it should be doing. Um, and here's a closer uh, view of what that looks like on, on the stretching um, surface. And so very early and in development, but this is where I want to just say where we're going with it. Um, there we go. And, you know, I'm not sure if this audience really wants to see what we're trying to plan to do, but the goal is, okay, well, we want to have normal and fibrotic ECM. I've demonstrated that that's a problem, that that can give extracellular cues. I've demonstrated that stretch can, is a problem, that can give extracellular cues. So here's, a, here's sort of the experiments that we're proposing and doing. You know, there's a change in my fibroblast. We've already shown that that happens. TGF beta activation, that can happen. Collagen production, that could happen. So all of these would be readouts for the experiment. And then we would come in with inhibitors that are available to block that YAP TAS to really try to implicate that and see what the role is for that. And once validated, then we'll have a new platform, hopefully to screen potential molecules that are important in perpetuating and blocking that feed forward fibrotic pathway. Um, and then in the last sort of closing minutes, the idea is to take all of these, this is the holy grail that, that I am trying to convince Jose that it's worthwhile doing, is taking all of these um, things that we've been developing, stretching, 2D hydrogels, different stiffnesses, combining them and having tunable matrices that maybe we can 3D print, which Jose spoke of last week, and Mabel has been really driving. And I'm imagining printing constructs that can just be slotted in to our cat structure so that um, all in one platform, we can really integrate the different ECMs, the different stiffnesses, uh, the different stretch patterns that need to be uh, performed um, really to advance these in vitro models and better understand mechanisms of pathology and lung fibrosis. So with that, um, I think I, yeah, I'm okay with time there. Uh, I'll just finish by saying, you know, uh, hopefully I've gone over the objectives here. Hopefully I've made an argument that lung health and disease is important to study and that for the individuals on this call, lung fibrosis might be something that is of interest. Um, we personally feel that the future in that space 
uh, is with more advanced models that include changing uh, uh, stiffness uh, and changing of, of the stretch of the cells. Uh, and with that, um, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, and we wouldn't be anywhere without the funding agencies, but also without the, all of us who probably reviewed at one point in time, um, because that's also a selfless act. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Jay. That was, uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? Oh, Alex, go ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Jay. That was great. Um, I had a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll just focus in on, on this nice stretcher that you, uh, that you showed just now. It, it's really neat. And so do I understand correctly that you're just stretching um, the substrate and, and exposing the cells to that stretching force, but you're not measuring the resistance to stretch that the cells uh, kind of produce as they are uh, responding to that? Or is that the plan is to also measure the impact that the cells have as they respond? It's a, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I know what our tool is able to do and our tool is, is actually just stretching. We actually don't have a real time even measurement of that, um, that there's not a force transducer in our system. We're not measuring mm -hmm. that. And we definitely aren't being able to understand what at the cellular level, what that cell is experiencing or what the cell is sort of maybe giving back to the surface. I, I don't even know how to begin to get at that and be open to opportunities for that. Okay. Um, any more questions, yeah, Jose? Thanks, Jay. That was a very, very nice presentation. It gives you know a lot of uh, meaning to the things that we're doing with the 3D printing uh, side. Uh, so I had a question about the YAP task reporter uh, and using that for sensing um, you know different stiffnesses in 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 the tissue or in the substrate. Um, I heard a really interesting talk uh, maybe about a year and a half, two years ago where they were talking about YAPTAS in the context of stiffness and topography, which you know is something that I'm interested in and how mm -hmm. you, know, you could have a stiff uh, substrate without topography and you would see the expected YAPTAS response, mm -hmm. but you could mm -hmm. see a, a stiff substrate with topography of a particular size and the cells, the fibroblasts grown on them would sense them as soft substrates. So I was wondering if you have any ideas of how the, you know, the collagen fiber topography within the lung is going to impact that readout um, of the YAP task, you know, not, not just the, the mm. stiffness, but also the sort of the milieu, the environment that the cells are sensing within the lung. So, I mean, I, I was aware that I, I, in the whole presentation, I didn't use the word topography and I knew I, I may have, you know, been too general. Um, I, I think it's an excellent point. Um, dare I, I fall back on what's happening in the clinical case? And is there a way for us actually to look at the IPF tissues that we get and maybe look at what that topography is and let us let that guide our experimental design? Um, because, you know, yeah, maybe it's less you know, stiffness is playing a role, but maybe there's an interaction between stiffness and topography that, that is actually even more crucial. And if we don't look at topography, we're, we're not going to know how important that is. Um, so, yeah, I have seen that, um, that the topography can also influence the YAPTAS. Um, and, you know, with these micro pillars, right? These cells on different pillars and, and, and sort of surfaces, um, and you can almost get the same response as one would think on this. So um, I'm open to exploring how we can test that. Um, and I think it probably should be tested properly, uh, but I would ground that in, can we somehow find out what the clinical cases are with the tissues we have access to, to then inform the topography that we try to develop in the lab, 
to then inform the questions that we we explore. But um, maybe that's future work for us to explore together. Thank you. Great. I actually have a follow up question on what just uh, Jose mentioned there. Um, I was wondering because you have these, you could you you will use these fibrotic desolarized matrix, right? So I was wondering, like modeling fibrosis, is all you need to do is to increase collagen content, increasing stiffness, like because if you take normal DCM just increasing collagen concentration, being make the matrix stiffer than the cells respond and it's, you, you kind of get that fibrotic condition, right? Yeah. But I, I wonder fibrotic fibrosis is uh, only respond to stiffness or increasing collagen. Like what if you take the fibrotic DECM, but dilute it so that it's not as stiff, but would you still be able to create a fibrotic condition if so, then there's something in that these in that fibrotic DCM that is contributing to this disease, in addition to the increase in collagen content and stiffness, right? I, I, that might be a really interesting thing to look at. Yeah, yeah I, it's a really good point, and um, which is why, you know, I kind of wanted to keep. Uh, maybe it didn't show well, but I do want to keep those conditions in there, kind of keep on control. ECM as well as fibrotic ECM, but also different concentrations of them because, uh, you know, a higher concentration of a normal ECM, is it the same thing as a low concentration of a fibrotic ECM? This is sort of getting at your dilution. And so we, we definitely need to tease that out. And then, you know, you can imagine then if you have a dilution environment, like experimental environment, then you could do add back experiments where you sort of see like, what well, well, I know I've diluted, and, and I, and, you know, I've dropped whatever a tenfold or fivefold. So if I put that back in, does that lead to you know, the recovery rescue of the phenotype? Um, I, I think that's what we want to do. And, and actually the plan here, even this, this week we were talking about, we, now that we have the fibrotic lung ECM, we're going to do a proteomic profiling of the, the matrosome from healthy and diseased. So we actually know what building blocks are to start. And then we'll be able to see what is different. Um, and then, you know, maybe those experiments will be better informed when we know what the, the composition is to start with. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, and actually just another comment. I just like, I, I was very impressed to, to see that um, with a stiffer matrix of, you know, uh, on polystyrene substrate, the, you show three different types of cells that become fibrotic like, right? Mm -hmm. so for people who are not, maybe not even building fibrotic model, but if it's, it looks like if people are using stiff matrix, like the standard polystyrene well-placed, inevitably they are creating a fibrotic condition. Um, even, even if they're not trying to model that, right? Uh, so that's- Yeah, uh, and, and, and another caution on that, which is really, really interesting, is that there's this, there's this principle they're calling mechanical memory. And so if you actually culture it on hard plastic for you know, two weeks, three weeks, or however many passages, and then you put it on soft, it reverts to soft for a bit. And then it goes back to as if it was growing on hard. So there's actually some potentially epigenetic programming that the hard matrix is, is doing. And that's actually a time dependent muscle or muscle memory, um, mechanical memory, which might make sense biologically speaking, because if you, you know, if you have a little bit of an injury that leads to a little bit of a stiffening, maybe inflammation based stiffening, you don't want to get on that terrible cycle. But if you, you know, then fix that wound and then, a, then you can revert back to a normal phenotype. But if you're always in the wound, it seems that the fibroblast and you're always growing on hard, hard plastic, the cells remember that. So you, we, we all need to be aware of that. That's what the data looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any more questions from the audience? Last chance. Okay, all good. Okay, sounds good. And uh, let's thank uh, Jeremy for the great presentation. And uh, thank you for coming. And, and uh, next week, 
we'll have a talk uh, from uh, Shaq Zhang from uh, Harvard University. And um, so thanks. Uh, thanks, Jay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, and happy weekend to all of you. Yeah. Have thanks, a nice Jay. Weekend, and thanks, Boyang. Thanks very much. This is great. Okay. Have a good weekend, okay. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.